Good morning. I'm the Reverend Rachel Hayes, Minister of the Unitarian Universalist Society of Amherst. I use she, her pronouns. Welcome to you. Old friends and new, young and old, in the Zoom and in the sanctuary. You are an essential part of our celebration today. Whether today is your first or your thousandth Sunday in our midst, we are stronger because you are with us. We are one people of many beliefs, many origins, sexualities, and genders. We are all growing, all learning, all loved. Just as you are, you are welcome here. Today, we're talking about black history in our faith, a hundred years ago and unfolding around us still. You may notice that I take my mask off to speak and then put it back on again to sing. Any of our worship leaders who unmask have taken a COVID test this morning. Our congregation has made the choice to prioritize the vulnerable rather than the comfortable with our masking policy. It's part of how we take care of one another. We come together, a fire held in one place, conducting the energy, linking the circle resisting just enough to shine, to burn, to light up the world with new ideas, with care for our neighbors, with beauty. We look to ancestors who have shown us the way to new achievements, to deeper compassion, to bigger dreams. We burn we shine, channeling the energy that would destroy into light. May the lights of our ancestors lead us into a brighter future together. Come, let us worship. I invite you to say the chalice lighting words with me. We light, light this, this flame, flame to invite, to invite a, world a world of, of peace. peace where we heal the wounds, where we share what we have with one another, where justice is another word for relationship, and we listen for what love has to say. Please rise in body and in spirit for our first hymn, This Little Light of Mine.
front for the time for all ages. All right. So I'm wondering if anyone, and that is not just the folks in front of me, can tell me about an inventor that they know of. Can anyone tell me the name of an inventor they know of? Eli Whitney, Edison, Bell. Anyone? Da Vinci. Now I'm wondering, what are some inventions that you use every day? Telephone? Light bulb, computer, nice. Cars, television, pencils, elevator, silverware, microphone. What? The garden? Golden? <clears throat> So I, it was mentioned, there is one invention, and someone did say it, that I'm pretty sure we all use every day. And it's one that we don't even think of that often, because it's just so commonplace. Do we have any guesses? The electricity, the light bulb. <clears throat> what? Plumbing. <laughs> but I didn't prepare a time for all ages on plumbing. I prepared a time for all ages on the light bulb. <laughs> we have so many light bulbs in our lives. Just look around this building for a minute. Just this room, there's light bulbs that go all along the edges. There's a light bulb that illuminates the stained glass. There are little tiny light bulbs, and there are big light bulbs. There are light bulbs that are only for emergencies that come on and flash. There are so many light bulbs in our lives. There are light bulbs in our cars. There are flashlights in our nightstands. Lamps. You walk into a room and the first thing you do is flip on a light switch. And I bet a lot of people think of one person when they think of light bulbs. So we can say it together. Who do we know as the inventor of the light bulb? Thomas Edison. <clears throat> Thomas Edison. Now the thing about inventions is that one person doesn't ever really make an invention. Inventions build on inventions of the past. And ideas become different ideas and those ideas might become a prototype or a test to see if that idea works. And then those get changed up and changed around and sometimes we throw them out all together. And that process never really ends. Even long after the first people with those ideas are gone, their inventions are still being changed into different and new things. So there was this man named Louis Latimer and he lived a long time ago, but not inconceivably long ago. He was born in the 1800s here in Massachusetts, in Chelsea. And he was a black man who was born to parents who had escaped slavery in Virginia. 
And so he was born in Chelsea, and he grew up to fight for the Union and the Civil War. But later, he became an inventor. And he worked on a lot of things, including designing toilets for train cars, which, I mean, I would argue is fairly important. He drew up the blueprints for Alexander Graham Bell's telephone. And eventually, Thomas Edison took note of this guy, and he hired him to work for him. And Latimer got to work looking at Edison's inventions and seeing how those could be changed and made even better. So in 1879, Edison had invented the incandescent light bulb. But it didn't actually work very well. It worked in that it lit up, but it, it used materials inside it called the filament that burned out fairly quickly. Those were cotton or bamboo or things like that. And so the light bulb didn't actually stay lit, which I would argue is a problem. And so in 1882, after he had been working with Edison for only a couple of years, Louis Latimer filed his own patent for a new kind of light bulb. And a patent is just a way to say, this is my idea. I had it first. So I will admit I don't know that much about light bulbs. I learned a lot learning about Louis Latimer. But that light bulb used something called a carbon filament instead of that cotton or that bamboo. And so it stayed burning brighter for longer. And it's Latimer's light bulb, not Edison's, that is the ancestor of those incandescent light bulbs that we used until very recently and we still have in some places in our houses. And now he did continue inventing. He came up with an early idea for an air conditioner, which also pretty great. Um, but his light bulb is really the invention that stuck around with us, even if his name didn't. And so I encourage you all to look at the inventions that we have in our lives, the little things, the silverware, the cups, and think about all of the different people and ideas that went into those. So today in religious education, we are going to go downstairs and we are going to talk about a, a trickster, a guy who also had some interesting ideas about how to teach people different things. And I just wanted to give folks the heads up that next week I am offering the service here. And I am actually going to invite all of our elementary students, if they would like next week to stay in the service for the whole time. You can also head downstairs with JC if you want next week. But I'm going to invite you to stay up here next week. So if you want to bring some extra things to do or anything like that, you are more than welcome to. And we're going to be talking about nature and we're going to be talking about how to find your way in nature and what to do if you get lost in nature, what not to do if you get lost in nature. And we're gonna, we're gonna have a lot of fun. So I just wanted to give parents and families the heads up. My own daughter is saying it's not going to be fun, but I swear it is. <laughs> I'm going to invite the children to head down to religious education with me as the congregation sings them out with the words in your order of worship. We are worthy, not because of what we produce, but because of who we are. We are divine bodies of light and darkness. You are not worthy because of what you offer, not because of what is in your mind, not for the support you give to others, not for what you give at all. We are worthy 
and are whole just because. And this great turning and this great pandemic and this radical readjustment and alignment, we are not disposable, we are needed. We are the very people that have withstood everything that has been thrown at us as a people. And as Maya Angelou would say, still I rise. We rise from the pain, we rise from the grief, we rise from the limits people place on us and the limits we place on ourselves. We rise to be the children and the ancestors. We rise to be our true selves, our true selves in relationship to our families and communities, recognizing our liberating and whole selves honoring them and others as we strive for abundant communities, abundant lives, abundant relationships, and abundant values and cultural manifestations. We are worthiness personified. I, you, we are worthy and deserve a life where we are not always fighting for our existence. Imagine what we could create if we were not always in the struggle. Imagine what we could envision if we could just be let to just go there. So tired of always having to resist, to fight, demanding, pushing to everyone that has the courage, the power, the ability to co-create what we want and need while rooting in what we can't lose and who we are. You are the visionary. You are the hope. You are our ancestors' dreams. No, you might not ever end up on some list somewhere, but you are on the list in someone's heart and mind. And if it is and how you move in the world so people can see by example, you are the embodiment of what we need. Thanks to all that are that embodiment the embodiment not of productivity, but the embodiment of radical love, care, and sanctuary. It's time, y'all. Embodiment time. Embodiment, living one's values out loud. Let me every day live my values out loud. Let us every day live our values out loud, embodying our values, not a productivity quotient, beyond productivity, past productivity, true embodiment, life. In 2015, I served as a delegate for my home congregation at General Assembly of the Unitarian Universalist Association for the first time. This was Portland if you're trying to place it in location. It was the year after the Black Lives Matter protests for Michael Brown and Eric Garner along with so many others if you're trying to place it in time. I was there to be in community with and learn from thousands of other Unitarian Universalists, but also to serve in our association's democratic process, to vote on the business decisions, to represent what it means to be a Unitarian Universalist in my home congregation, and in the world. What I had done that year with my congregation was to support the Black Lives Matter movement, going to protests together and planning public witness events on our piece of sidewalk on Central Park West. The Youth Caucus at General Assembly that summer brought forward an AIW, or Action of Immediate Witness, support the Black Lives Matter movement. The youth business managers had spent months building relationships and collaborating with DRUM, diverse revolutionary Unitarian Universalist Multicultural Ministries, and ARE, 
Allies for Racial Equity, to compose the AIW. And it made it to a final vote on the floor of the general session at the head of the pro line with the youth delegates was a black adult clearly working closely with the youth. I was farther back in that line with the other delegates from my congregation and we never got to the front to say our two minutes. But that was okay because the youth and this black adult were filling the whole convention hall up with truth. Maybe you noticed that image, or maybe it just stood out to me. In the video, we just saw Elandria at the pro mic with a crowd of youth right behind. This was how I met Elandria, deep into organizing, side by side with collaborators, calling us all into justice and a better future. I don't remember exactly what Alandria said nearly eight years ago, but I think E's words read by Ian Hill gave us a taste of them. Unitarian Universalist history might not be the first place we look for black history, or vice versa. But there is a long history of black Unitarians, Universalists, and Unitarian Universalists changing the world. And a lot of black U or UU ministers, though that's not where we're going today. Maybe some of you remember Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, a freeborn black educator, published poet, essayist, and circuit riding abolitionist. She donated proceeds from her book sales to the Underground Railroad. She was a member of the Unitarian and Baptist churches in Philadelphia. Double belonging has always been a thing with us. And there's Lewis Latimer, of course, who Andrew told us about, a draftsman of the golden age of invention and inventor himself, who gave us the carbon filament light bulb and literally wrote the book on incandescent lighting. He worked with the big ones, with Bell and Edison, and he also volunteered with immigrants at the Henry Street Settlement in New York City, teaching drafting and English so they could get ahead in their adopted culture. Latimer was a founding member of the Unitarian Church in Flushing, Queens. And the man my elementary school was named for, Whitney Young. Whitney Young Jr. was a social worker turned civil rights leader. He was the director of the National Urban League and worked with Martin Luther King Jr., John Lewis, and others to plan the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Young and his family belonged to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Atlanta. These are just three of the many amazing black Unitarian and universe, Unitarian Universalist lay people. Just the first three historical examples that come to mind. There are just as many co contemporary black Unitarian Universalists doing amazing things in our faith and in the world. There's a whole organizing collective called Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism. Some of these people grew up in our pews and some of them found us as adults. Are we paying attention to what they have to say? I can count on one hand the Black UU leaders dying young in recent years. And I can count on the other black leaders I know personally who are no longer Unitarian Universalist because it was too hard. 
I miss them. We, as a movement, miss them. Alandria Williams grew up in the Tennessee Valley Unitarian Universalist Church in Knoxville. E was a black, queer, disabled, and chronically ill person. E was a teacher, an organizer, a mentor, a daughter, a twin, and a friend to many. E was a person of many communities, and E touched so many lives. In Unitarian Universalist community, Elandria used E or they, them as their pronouns, so that's how I'll speak of them. In Unitarian Universalist community and in East Tennessee, where E lived, E was a passionate advocate for racial justice, economic fairness, and democracy. E worked with the legendary Highlander Center, which has trained organizers for decades, and with People's Hub, a new online movement education community. E was active not only in their congregation, but in the wider Unitarian Universalist Association. E was a leader as a youth and a young adult, Alandria served alongside Mr. Barb Grieve as co-moderators of the association, basically the highest profile volunteer position in the whole association. And we got to see a lot of E's bright and loving personality from the moderator's podium of the General Assembly. It was in that context the deep democratic rituals of our shared faith that I knew E. Those who knew E closely would have different, more intimate stories to hold today, but thousands of UUs had an experience like mine, and I believe many more know E's spirit and impact, if not their name. One thing he said to all of us in that main hall of the convention center of one convention center or another made a huge impact on me he called out the vision of the youth he called out the wisdom of the elders and then he said and who hears a yelder not a youth or an elder but you're still here and the rest of the room cheered, right? E made it clear that there was a place in this work for all of us. We don't all have the same role or all need to do the same thing, but there is space for all of us to find ourselves in the movement. The book Belonging, a Spiritual Guide for Navigating Adulthood includes a reflection by E. It's called Honoring Our Ancestors. Here's an excerpt. The history and legacy of Unitarian Universalism are shaped by the ancestors in our congregations. We are part of the connective tissue that holds the legacy and future of our faith. We are the children of freedom fighters, visionaries, and radical liberal theologians. We are the phoenix rising out of the ashes of the McCarthy era and the civil rights, women's, and queer liberation movements. We are the survivors and beneficiaries of youth-led and youth-focused beliefs and programming that encouraged us to be change makers, boundary pushers, and institutionalists at the same time. We are and will be the ministers, religious educators, congregational presidents, organizers, and social change leaders of our faith and social change leaders our faith has led us to be. We wear our faith as tattoos on our bodies and in our hearts as testament to the blood 
tears, dreams, and inspirations of our community, ancestors, and elders. Now, Alandria is one of those ancestors. He died in 2021 at the age of 41, leaving behind a legacy of love, movement building, and people sharing the work and joy of building a brighter tomorrow. E's vision for Unitarian Universalism, where everyone is welcome and part of the beloved community, where we all live into our promises about the inherent worth and dignity of all people and center those whom our movement has marginalized, including black, queer, young, and disabled people, where we value the legacy of our ancestors and elders, where we follow the leadership of our youth, where we share the power and love boldly and have so much joy connecting with each other and the world. That is the Unitarian Universalism that inspires me to keep going when things are hard. That is the Unitarian Universalism I want to share with you, rooted in the traditions of questioners, reformers, and true believers, rooted most of all in love. I close this reflection with more of Alandria's writing. This is called Meditation on the Power of We. Put your feet down because we're about to do an embodiment. Close your eyes. Breathe in and breathe out. When you hear the word liberation, liberatory spirit, liberatory life, liberatory possibilities, what does that conjure in your soul? When you hear, we are the liberating force, spirit, light and love, what does that conjure in your spirit? When you hear that we have the power to transform the world around us, what does that mean in your bones? When you hear we are the people that we have been waiting for, we are, how does that feel in your blood? We are the light. We are the wisdom. We are the ancestors. We are those yet to come. How do we fully hold all of that in ourselves? Open your eyes. Look at the people around you and go out and organize.
We are the ones. We are the ones. We are going to carry this love out into the world, share it with so many people, and light the whole thing up. Go in peace.